A very good evening, everyone. I, Dr. Karmeet Kaur, welcome you all who are joining us from around the world for an exciting webinar on breast pathology in the AIMS webinar series under my scope. I now invite Professor A.K. Dinda to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Kamaljeet Singh. Sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Kapneet. I think I uh, welcome all the participants uh, in this, uh, this series of talks, which is actually successfully organized by Department of Pathology AIMS under the leadership of Professor Venkat. Now, today, uh, we are fortunate to have the expert uh, to deliver the talk is Dr. Kamaljit uh, Singh. Now, Dr. Kamaljit actually is a very, uh, <clears throat> he did his uh, MBBS, that is from Pandit Bhagavad Dayal Sharma Postgraduate Institute of Medical Science in Rotak. And after that, he joined the Department of Pathology AIMS for his MD. And uh, the, fortunately, I have a very close interaction with him as he did his uh, MD thesis in the renal pathology uh, unit. And after that, uh, completing in 2006, uh, he went to US uh, in 2007 and started his uh, research fellowship in John Hopkins uh, Hospital in Wilmar Eye Institute, area of ophthalmic pathology. And then he did his uh, the uh, residency program in, in US and in Alpert Medical School of Brown University. And followed by also he did his uh, one fellowship stint in the uh, Boston, the Bart Israel uh, Deconents Medical Center. And after completing that, he currently is the, he's a faculty in the, uh, the Alper uh, Medical School. And uh, there is a long list of uh, the uh, owners and awards um, under his name. I'm not going to the detail. Few important thing, he has got more than 50 uh, the uh, index, uh, the uh, article published in good high impact journals. And he currently he is interested in the uh, area of uh, breast pathology and other uh, pathology related to women. And uh, today's talk is also related to that area. So I, uh, I now introduce Dr. Kamaljit Singh to you and request him to start and deliver his talk. Dr. Kamaljit. Thank you so much, Dr. Dinda, for the kind and generous introduction. Uh, I will start by thanking Dr. Venkat for giving this uh, opportunity to share the po podium with my previous mentors, my previous colleagues. It's just a great pleasure to be part of the, this series. And uh, I also want to thank Dr. Mathur and his uh, group who helped me uh, setting up the, with the technical part of this. Uh, let me, so the title of the talk, uh, my talk today is uh, Short Stories on Lobular Neoplasia. Let me share my screen. So uh, the title, in the title I put uh, the years, 1919 to 2021. So the idea is uh, to take you on a journey uh, with me and tell you about uh, sort of a life story of lobular neoplasia. And uh, we will start from the beginning and uh, the end will be close to 2021, the 2019 where the fifth edition of uh, the blue book for the breast tumors is posted. So actually I will start with an image. And uh, while during this talk, I will show you multiple uh, cases. And uh, if uh, I know there, were, there are many live listeners with us and uh, there will be people who will be listening us, uh, listening to the lecture later. So people who are live with us, they can, if they want, uh, they can post their diagnoses as uh, I show these uh, HNE images. And uh, we will take the questions uh, at the end. So I'll start with this first uh, case. Uh, and this, this is just very simple. It's, um, uh, this, is, this just shows you an example how lobular neoplasia can hide in the background. So this, uh, in this image you have, this is one of the sections from the breast. Uh, on the left, you can see this slightly dilated uh, 
duct. And just from the, this magnification, it may sound like, oh, this is all ducto because you have this nice rounded uh, polarized spaces. So that's a typical. And you're thinking, oh, a typical ductal hyplasia maybe gets close to DCIS. And here it's pretty solid, the nice pointed out spaces. But at the same time, um, if you squint a little bit, you will see this um, sort of slightly different looking monomorphic solid, slightly discohesive epithelial proliferation. High magnification, you can totally see it now. It's slightly different from the other uh, rest of the ductal proliferation, which is polarizing and forming the ducts. So the diagnosis in this case is ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, or if you're not sure, you know, this is a very small sample, so you can say it's really typical bordering on local TCIS. But the, the main, um, uh, you know, finding here is, which I wanted to highlight, was there's uh, hiding lobular neoplasia. And uh, just going over the slides again, so these cells are the lobular neoplasia cells, and you can confirm it with the uh, immunostain. So this is the e cadran IHC, which highlights the loss of... Um, staining uh, in the lobular neoplasia cells, which are nicely mixing up with the uh, atypical ductal proliferation. So with that, um, uh, why did I choose this talk? Uh, because uh, lobular neoplasia, it makes sort of the 10% of the total proliferative lesions in the breast. However, still there are so many issues with the lobular neoplasia. And anybody who looks at the breast uh, cases uh, will uh, understand what I'm trying to say. So there is, uh, uh, there are some issues about the nomenclature, when to use a typical lobular hyperplasia, when to use LCIS, when to uh, start thinking whether this is pleomorphic or florid LCIS. And there's a lot of uh, uh, ambiguity in uh, identifying or naming invasive carcinoma as ductal or lobular, or how to use the ECAG and P120 IHC. So we'll talk about that. Uh, other important issue with lobular neoplasia is that um, uh, there is no specific mammographic abnormality with which the lobular neoplasia usually presents. So it's in biopsies, usually it's an incidental finding. Uh, that's a very important fact to keep in mind while you're looking at the coronal biopsies. Uh, other important issue that has been extensively discussed uh, in the literature is whether it's a risk indicator or actually it's a non-obligate precursor. So we will talk, we'll talk a little bit about that. And that also bleeds into the biological and clinical significance uh, of the lobular neoplasia. I will go over the morphological variants of the in situ and invasive carcinoma, which is the same as sort of grading of the lobular neoplasia. Uh, and then we will talk a little bit about the management of the, these lesions. So this is an example of, that shows you, uh, you know, the difficulty with the lobular lesion. So the top, in the top part, we have the, this is the screenshot from the publication from 2017 when the new AJCC came out and they took the lobular LCIS out of the TIS category. So you don't have to call it as TIS and there's no synoptic sheet. They call it a benign entity and removed it from TNM staging, which is actually convenient for a pathologist. And at the same time, um, they said that the committee said there is insufficient data, data on, in the literature to comment on the outcome and the criteria of the pleomorphic LCIS. And they don't mention florid LCIS. So the, these are relatively, that just tells you that these are new entities and we're still studying them. However, in 2019, the new WHO book comes up with the first time they have a specific uh, diagnosis of pleomorphic and florid LCIS. And they also talk about uh, how to manage it, the both of them. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So these are the contents of the stories. I already mentioned it, uh, what we're gonna talk about. And at the same time, as I said, I'm gonna show you some uh, uh, images, the HNE images of the cases. And if you want to participate in the live lecture, you can uh, type in your diagnosis and we will take the questions in the end. So, and uh, these are the two papers. Most of the literature that I'm going to show you, uh, I have uh, was able to review it while we were doing these two papers. Um, these were the original articles. The first one, we looked at uh, intra-observer variability to diagnose the pleomorphic and florid LCIS. And the second one is the 
uh, outcome of the classic and non-classical lobular carcinoma in say two uh, that were initially diagnosed in the corneal biopsy. So I will show you a lot of data in the end uh, when we talk about the uh, pleomorphic and florid LCIS. So, uh, so this is the timeline of the events that uh, have happened uh, when, as people, as the, as other authors, they have worked on the lobular neoplasia. So uh, we're going to talk about this uh, timeline. And as we talk, uh, as we go through this, uh, we'll discuss how um, the lobular neoplasia initially started as a, was thought as a precursor, then changed to risk factor. Then it was again, um, there was evidence that no, actually it's a uh, precursor to the invasive lobular carcinoma. Uh, other important thing to keep in mind, which is sort of the take home message for this talk is to how to differentiate the variants from the DCIS, because very often the, the pleomorphic and florid LCIS are confused with DCIS and misdiagnosed as DCIS. Uh, and then uh, the relevance of the lobular neoplasia and the coronal biopsy. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. So how did it start? So the, it all started in 1941, and uh, you'll see this in almost any standard breast pathology book. Uh, if you're in the lobular neoplasia chapter, that the credit is given to uh, Foot and Stewart in 1941. Um, they first mentioned the uh, combination of words, the lobular carcinoma in situ. However, they, in their paper, they do mention that uh, they found that Evans might have seen this first. And he he called it precancerous changes, but he didn't, um, you know, give it a name, lobular carcinoma in situ. And this is the image which they put in their paper. And they think that this probably is lobular carcinoma in situ. So uh, what did Foot and Stewart uh, they do in their paper? They were looking at uh, mastectomies. Um, and they found this uh, uh, introductal epithelial proliferation in 10 cases. Uh, there were two that were very subtle, three with moderate and five with marked proliferation, which they call lobular carcinoma in situ. And in their paper, they described the clinical features and the histological features. And the description is, in so, is it, it has so much details that if you look at it, there's nothing has changed in LCIS description clinically as well as histologically in the last 100 years. So they, they describe that these lesions are undetectable. Um, they, 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 they see them in the same age group, age group as other mammary cancer, which is the ductal type. No nipple changes are seen with these, and that's true. Uh, with infiltration, uh, they see the changes that they see in any other mammary cancer. And this is the first paper where they use the carcinoma in situ terminology before this, the terminology that was commonly used was just comedo carcinoma or introductal carcinoma. And they proposed that the, this think the origin is in the smaller ducts and lobules. And that's why they called it totilobular carcinoma in situ. Uh, other peculiar thing that they noted was it's often mixed with non-lobular pattern. And that's a common theme with lobular neoplasia that uh, most of these lesions rarely occur in pure form. They're often mixed with ADH, columnar cell lesions, and the ductal processes. And uh, only uh, situation where you see them as pure form is when they're pleomorphic or florid uh, patterns. So here are the, some of the histological descriptions. And um, this picture is not from their paper. This is my image. At that time, there were only black and white images in the journals. So they describe the histology. They say there's an abrupt uh, sudden change in the cytology. And that's very useful when you're looking at the breast case at a low power, you can pick it from the low power, the lobular neoplasia, the ALH and LCIS. It just looks very distinct from the rest of the TDLU. The cells are large, they're two times the normal epithelium. Their nuclei are slightly clear, but they're not hypochromatic. And that's also important. When you're looking at a pleomorphic or uh, LCIS, the nuclei are a little darker. So that's a clue if you're from low power, and you're looking at a lobular lesion, it actually looks a little darker, then you might be looking at a pleomorphic LCIS. So there's a peculiar change in the cytoplasm as well. It is acidophilic, often maculated, as you can see in this image. They also describe loss of cohesion. There was no mention, there is no E cadran in the picture, but they did notice that the cells look adhesive and they described the mucin. 
Mitosis are rare. That's also important when you are looking at a lobular neoplasia because rarely you will see uh, mitosis in a classical LCIS, very rarely, mitosis and apoptosis. If you're seeing mitosis and apoptosis, there's a chance that you might end up in fluid or pleomorphic LCIS in the next slide. So that's just uh, something to keep in mind. They describe the pagetoid pattern um, where the cells, they creep below the native epithelium. Um, and they, they call it because the histological findings were similar to the Paget disease of the breast. So with, their, with this paper, um, uh, one thing that happened was that people started to believe that that's the precursor for the invasive carcinoma. And uh, in the next um, 10 or 20 decades, a uh, lot of females, they had mastectomies. Uh, so there were no, it, this was an era where there were no corneal biopsies. So there's a little excision. You diagnose lobular carcinoma in situ, and the person will get a mastectomy. And many times, people, uh, the authors, the workers, they started to notice that there was no carcinoma in these uh, breasts. So there was there were a lot of publications in the next 20, 30 years where they thought that this could may not be a precursor, and it probably is just a risk factor. And especially in those cases where there was no carcinoma in the mastectomy, and so there were a bunch of publications. Uh, I'm just uh, showing you a few here. Um, the one from JAMA, uh, 1967, which showed that th this uh, presence of LCIS, it was a risk factor and it was cumulative and it affects both breasts, ipsilateral and contralateral. There was an increased risk of uh, breast cancer. Another uh, publication from Wheeler who had 98 patients and follow-up of 16 years and there was an increased risk of breast cancer on both sides. Similarly, Hagenson comes into picture because we, I'll show you a bunch of other publications from him. And he also showed that it was, there was an increased risk factor with LCIS. So um, Hagenson publishes this uh, important paper in 1972. It was a review where uh, he uh, introduced the term lobular neoplasia. So one thing I want you to note is there's no atypical lobular hyperplasia so far discovered. So we're just talking about LCIS. And the new terminology that he introduces in 1972 is lobular neoplasia. And he does it largely to get away from this carcinoma in situ terminology that was coined earlier. And he calls it um, benign process, but precancerous process. And he largely does it to avoid mastectomy. And in his recommendation, he discourages mastectomies for the LCIS, and he proposes that uh, you can have uh, substituted with a lifelong follow-up. And further, he, um, he tries to classify LCIS into type A and type B cells. So I, I don't know how many of uh, people uh, in the audience use it. I often use it when uh, I have to defend uh, my diagnosis as classic LCIS, say that it's not getting to pleomorphic uh, LCIS extent of changes. Because the type B cells, uh, as I will show you, they can get pretty close to uh, pleomorphic uh, category. So what are type A cells? So type A cells are the, this is the picture that I showed you earlier. So when the lobular neoplasia cells, they're small, round, and they're almost similar to SNR epithelium. And they are small, round, often dark nucleus, no nucleolus, and they're minimal cytoplasm. So that's the type A cell. The type B cells, they're slightly larger. They, are, they have a slightly larger uh, round to oval nucleus. They can have a little irregular nuclear membrane. The chromatin is open. There's no often no obvious nucleus. And the cytoplasm is more evident in type B. Here's a picture where the type B is getting a little bit more uh, funny. The nuclei are slightly darker, larger, irregular. There's some binucleation. Um, I think there was a hint of apoptosis somewhere. So this is still type B. It's not uh, pleomorphic LCI. So Hagenson describes type A, type B in 1972. Uh, and then uh, we switch from precursor to uh, risk factor for LCIS. So let's go to the next event, which is the birth of the atypical lobular hyperplasia. And that occurs in 1978. So this is, uh, Paul Peter Rosen is uh, one of the authors on the study where, and it's a typical study that was occurring at this time where people are looking at the mastectomies that uh, have LCIS and they are, 
or the excisions that have LCIS, and they are looking at the follow-up. Uh, how, how do the patient do? Do they develop any breast cancer, ipsilateral or contralateral? And there were two pathologists on the study, and they found that they, in, in some situations, they cannot agree on LCIS. So one person, pathologist will call it LCIS, and the other person looks at it and says, no, I'm not convinced. So they decided, okay, for this situation, they're gonna call it atypical lobular hyperplasia. And that's where the first, uh, in this paper, the atypical lobular hyperplasia was used. And on the right, I'm showing you this picture where you will use this terminology. Basically, you have one TDLU, which is partially involved by this pegetoid epithelial proliferation. There's no distension of the SNI. Um, there are very few cells, it's partial involvement. And those were the criteria used by um, uh, authors in this. And then they were further refined and, uh, in the subsequent papers. And so they, basically the, this is taken from the Rosen's Breast Pathology fourth edition. And the LC, if the lobular neoplasia cells, they uh, involve less than 50% of the involved uh, of the lobule there's lack of clear distension or distortion of the TDLU. And if you can still see the open lumina, you can call it ALH. Now the picture that I'm showing you on the right, actually it's a duct that is involved by the um, uh, lobular neoplasia and it's all actually the partial involvement of the duct. And I would just want to mention stress, stress here is that the distinction of ALH versus LCIS is done in a lobule. So if you have an involvement of the duct, you really can't tell it's ALH or LCIS. And I think the best way to handle the situation, especially in a coronal biopsy, is just call it lobular neoplasia and say that in a comment that um, uh, all you see is a pegetoid involvement by the lob lobular neoplasia. And it's certainly focal if it's just uh, one duct. Now, this is uh, our, this is the first case that I'm gonna show you. And if you know the diagnosis, you can type in your comments. Um, I will show you a few HNEs and then maybe immuno. So this is a coronal biopsy uh, from a 54, 55 year old female and it was done for an architectural distortion that was picked up on a, a screening mammogram. And uh, you can see the core and um, can see there's a little epithelial proliferation here, which is centered around this uh, pale pink eosinophilic uh, stroma, which is slightly hypocellular. And uh, you can see the stroma is mixed. There's some dense pink, and then there's this pale uh, gray pinkish stuff that is called elastosis. So you need that to, uh, and the moment you have that, you start thinking about radial scar. And the arrangement of the epithelial proliferation also fits. They're all pointing towards the central uh, fibroelastotic stroma. Now, there's another picture, another core, and you, you actually can see the fibroelastotic stroma better. So I think you may see, okay, architectural distortion, radius scar, we're done. This represents her abnormality. However, the radius scars can harbor many uh, lesions, many epithelial proliferations. Uh, so to take, it, uh, you know, take a close look at the epithelial proliferation on the low power, most of it does look like usual ductal hyperplasia. There are sort of distended spaces, but mixed epithelial proliferation, uh, variable size uh, spaces. A closer look, this does look like usual ductal hyperplasia. However, if you look closely, some of the cells uh, in this, uh, they, they are a little monomorphic. Uh, they have slightly more cytoplasm, some clearing and pale chromatin. So you're wondering if there's something else going on in addition to radial scar. And then another focus, this looks like an expanded lobule. So you start to think about uh, lobular neoplasia. Uh, it's very monomorphic uh, and there's a suggestion of dysfusion. There's, they're not sticking to each other. Another picture where your suspicion for lobular neoplasia grows further, there's dysfusion, there's slightly pale uh, cytoplasm, monomorphism, no duct formation. Now, next step would be you do ECAD. Now, the other question is, in this situation, it may, it may, you might have to deal with whether I call it radial scar with ALH or radial scar with LCIS. And you may, end up over calling or under calling actually it's because some of these uh, UDH cells may look like lobular neoplasia. So I many times do ECAD in this because um, this will highlight the extent of the lobular neoplasia in this background of UDH. And as you can see, there are not very a lot of cells from the lobular neoplasia. Most of it is UDH. It's 
So the, with ECAD, uh, you will see the loss of the membrane staining if it's a lobular neoplasia, and this confirms it. So again, another picture, UDH with the lobular neoplasia cells. So the diagnosis in this case is radial scar involved by lobular neoplasia. I mean, in this particular case, I might go down in the comment and say it's best characterized as a typical lobular neoplasia in this um, limited sample. However, I mean, uh, since this was done for asymmetry, we see radial scar that equals excision anyways. So uh, she will, get, the person will get uh, managed by a small excision and uh, no matter you call it ALH or LCIS. So this is the second case, uh, or next case, uh, where uh, I'm showing you three images uh, from three different cases. I will call this image one, image two, and the bottom slightly more eosinophilic one, image three. And the question is, which one of these three cases has lobular neoplasia? And there are, there are different cases. So more little uh, better picture on image one. Uh, you see these nests of sort of basaloid uh, uh, cells with this uh, grayish blue uh, material. There's some retraction. I mention it because it's important. Um, second image, you got a similar sort of bluish basaloid with this regular, almost think you making you think it's cribriform, but pay attention, they're filled with pink. And another clue is the center part is sort of frail less pink and there's a ring of dense pinkness uh, at the edge. And sometimes you can see this elongated cells adhere to it. Third case, sort of similar, um, this vaguely cribriform architecture. And then there are cells that are lining these. And in this particular case, the cells, they have more cytoplasm. So there's something going on. So I'm gonna focus on image three more, Sorry, I'm gonna show you more images uh, from this case. So here's another image, um, and this is slightly higher magnification, and you can see there are, you can see the cytology of the cells better. And um, the, the caveat here is uh, not to go down the ductal pathway. It's just because they are making this big cribriform architecture. So. And when you look at these cells carefully, they have monomorphism, moderate to abundant cytoplasm, over dark nucleus. And uh, the differential here is DCIS versus a lobular neoplasia involving a collagenous spherulosis. So this is another uh, focus from the same case. Uh, this looks more busy here. And you have still have this vague pseudo, I would say, cribriform spaces and this monomorphic uh, cellular population. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a high magnification from the same case. And here the, the, phenot the lobular phenotype is more obvious. Uh, they're adhesive. They have slight maculation and clearing of the cytoplasm. Uh, and uh, I think you need to do a ECAD on this case, uh, definitely, because there is a differential DCIS versus uh, LCIS involving collagenous spherulosis. And ECADRIN highlights these lobular cells nicely, loss of ECADRIN immunized chemical staining in these areas. So the answer is image three, which has uh, the diagnosis is uh, LCIS involving collagenous spherulosis. Uh, and the second case, uh, image two was just collagenous spherulosis. Uh, the first image was adenocystic carcinoma of the breast. The third situation or uh, setting where you can see lobular neoplasia involving uh, a, a separate uh, breast lesion is uh, where the lobular neoplasia involves a uh, fibroepithelial lesion. And the common of those is fibroadenoma. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this is a section, uh, low, low magnification image from a section of a fibroepithelial lesion from the low power. There are all those, there are some vague leaf-like structures. However, I think more, it looks more like a fibroadenoma. And from low power, it's hard to see. However, uh, there are some areas where you have this, uh, the epithelial profiles are more uh, busy. They are more filled with the cells. So medium magnification, um, you see these, um, you go to these busy areas and they do look like this monomorphic sort of low to intermediate grade uh, epithelial proliferation. There is no duct formation. Um, they are just sheets of cells. Uh, and 
all, and I would say when you're looking at the solid epithelial proliferation, that's the first clue where you start thinking about the ducts and they rarely show any uh, pleomorphism. They may have a typical nuclei, but they, they all look uh, at the same level. So, and then there, look at the cytoplasm, there's some maculation, there's some clearing, and there's some evidence of dishesion. So you start to think about, oh, this is an LCIS involved in the fibroid lesion. And this particular case, uh, it was unusual. It also had invasion in the stroma. So there are these loose, um, small, variable size clusters of cells that seem to be outside into the stroma. So this was a, a invasive lobular carcinoma and LCIS involving the fibroid lesion with fibroid noma. Um, it, it's, uh, you can see it. Uh, um, and uh, typically this will lead to excision. Uh, the other scenario will be where the target lesion is a mass, which is a fibroid noma. You they sample the fibroid noma and there's ALH in the lobule uh, adjacent to the fibroid noma. So that's another setting where you will see uh, 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 lobular neoplasia in uh, with, uh, fibroid noma. But in that particular case, you really need to correlate whether that uh, with the radiology findings and the clinical history to make sure that that lobular neoplasia is maybe an incidental finding. So, and the target lesion actually is fibroid noma. So with that, um, so I described three lesions, radial scar, collagen swellosis, and fibroid noma, where the lobular neoplasia can uh, sort of populate the pre-existing lesion. Now let's go on to the timeline. So the next paper that comes, I actually already, already described the ALH, the birth of ALH in 1978 with Paul Peter Rosen's paper, but Hagenson comes back and he publishes another paper in 1978. And he, he is looking at all these uh, lobular lesions and he says that, well, the type A, type B classification doesn't work. And he says that uh, the, the quality of lobular neoplasia and the quantity did not predict the subsequent carcinoma. And this is the first paper where they actually uh, describe uh, the cumulative effect of the family history and uh, other proliferative changes in the lobular neoplasia on the risk of carcinoma. So he, he abandons, uh, I mean, we, we still use it, but he said just calling it type A, type B doesn't work. It's too simple. And in his paper, he describes other patterns also. And one of them I want to mention is macro SNR. So we use that, and many authors have used it when they're describing this exuberant proliferation, especially for LCIS. So they use macro SNR. And he further describes uh, saying that uh, these lesions are often multicentric and the carcinomas sometimes develop after long interval. And they can be of several histologic type, lobular, ductal, tubular. So that's 1978, um, uh, the type A, type B classification, he stops it. Now let's go into the, what happens in the next coming decades. So after 80, uh, folks start to pick the variants of the invasive lobular carcinoma. And uh, in these variants, um, comes the pleomorphic variant of the invasive lobular carcinoma. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those. So this is one of the paper from 1982, shows a table that uh, in, and tells you how we were classifying the invasive lobular carcinoma at that time, classical solid variant and alveolar variant. And um, there's a mixed group. And so pleomorphic carcinoma comes out of this. Um, th these are cohesive cells with marked nuclear pleomorphism. And, why this table was important because there was sort of a uh, impact on the survival. The solid one was the worst, classic one was the best. So, and there were a lot of publications this time where in 19, this is from 1992, there are two, two uh, publications. They are stressing on this pleomorphic variant of mesolobal carcinoma. And they, they, they describe this worst prognosis. So if you compare classic versus pleomorphic, it's four times worse. And if you, compare classic with lymph node positivity with pleomorphic with lymph node positivity, it's like almost three or four times worse. So pleomorphic ILC is bad. We know that in 1990s. And this is one of the pictures which many people may call it pleomorphic and or some people may call it histiocytoid because the cells have a lot of fluffy cytoplasm. So one of the examples. So we, I'm gonna show you some of the pictures of the the special subtypes of the invasive lobular carcinoma that may fit into pleomorphic categories. So one of them is 
this carcinoma with signet ring cell differentiation. This was an entity in the WHO, uh, last WHO. Now it's not present as a separate. So most of the times uh, it's a lobular carcinoma with a lot of intracytoplasmic mucin. And uh, most of the times it will be associated with the uh, inside lesion and it's easy to diagnose. Sometimes the degree of pleomorphism will be high. And I think in the absence of an inside lesion and if there's a lot of LVI, I might start to think about a um, MET. And I think that's a good idea. So I usually go to the clinical history and check if the person has a known history of lung or colon you know, or any other colloid or signet ring carcinoma, because these, uh, the, you can see these histologies uh, in the other sites. And look for inside a component. If you have one, usually there will be a high grade component that, that will sort of clinch your diagnosis that this is a primary. And the two cases that I have seen as a met, they had this dirty background, both were from the colon. So if you see it's, the background is a little dirty, then think of colon. And especially these tumors, those uh, high-grade uh, or pleomorphic invasive lobular carcinomas, they can be triple negative or HER2 positive. So if it is triple negative, then I would may think of doing GATA3 and SOX10, hoping that they come out positive if I don't have inside a component or some unknown history. So that's the uh, invasive lobular carcinoma with signet ring cells. Now I'm going to show you share you another interesting case of uh, invasive. Uh, Carcinoma. Um, so here's the HE image. Uh, this was an excision biopsy of a right breast mass in a 55 year old. And uh, I don't see any benign background breast tissue. All I see is sheets of tumor cells. And there's some residual fat with the tumor cells are infiltrating. Uh, it has a lot of these cracks, which I think is an artifact. So we have to go to a high power, so medium magnification. There seem to be vague packets of cells, nesting pattern. Uh, they, they are intermediate grade nuclei. They're not too many mitosis, so sort of grade two uh, tumor, uh, nuclear all around, thick nuclear membrane. There's some inconspicuous nucleolus. I don't know if it gives you a salt and pepper feeling. I mean, you may start to think about that. Uh, yeah, maybe, but I guess neuroendocrine is a good differential. Um, it doesn't look like a typical uh, breast carcinoma. I mean, you may think about solid papillary, but it's not very typical solid papillary. I don't see good uh, petite thin papillary. They're more nests or packed nests. So synaptophysin was done and the, the tumor is positive diffusely, but many breast tumors can be synaptopositive and synapto in itself doesn't uh, declare anything neuroendocrine. Uh, it can be positive in many things. However, the tumor was chromogranin positive as well. So this was really neuroendocrine differentiation. Uh, ECAD was done and uh, I would say pay attention to this because um, it seems positive and indeed there is a lot of staining. However, there is this uh, perinuclear dot-like staining, which is not normal staining for ECAD. So that was funny. Um, I don't know if ever, Many people do P120, but that's a very nice marker and I'm gonna talk about it in my later slides. So P120, in a ductal tumor, you want the membranous staining. This is, there is some vague membranous staining, but there's also cytoplasmic staining, which is abnormal. So this protein is attached to membrane. The staining should be membranous, but there's cytoplasmic staining, so abnormal staining. And then there were areas which I had shown you earlier as a first slide, you will just say, oh, this is invasive lobular carcinoma. But these cases, these areas were then she had mastectomy. So this image actually is from the follow-up mastectomy, which showed this um, single filing, um, intermediate grade two nuclei, dishesive uh, appearance. Um, there is this uh, retraction, um, which is very obvious right here. So this looks like invasive lobular carcinoma. However, the ECAD staining and the neuroendocrine differentiation was unusual. So the GATA3 was done, which is positive. GCDFP is positive. So this is a, a primary breast cancer because metastatic neuroendocrine tumor that they come into differential. So this was um, invasive lobular carcinoma, solid variant with neuroendocrine differentiation. And the reason I'm showing this case is because whenever we talk about neuroendocrine differenti differentiation, we often think we're talking about ductal tumors. And this is a nice example where uh, 
um, um, you see this uh, differentiation in lobular tumor. And um, um, this was originally diagnosed as uh, uh, invasive uh, carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation, but on mastectomy, we picked up these single file pattern and there was an uh, inside a component as well. So the message is, uh, and so the other message that I wanted to, which I will come to in later slides is the ECAD staining, uh, which if it's funny, if it's not normal membranous, it's time to pause and think. Could it be lobular? So here's an example for comparison. This is actually a true uh, it's a ductal type uh, carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation, which in this new WHO book would be called just neuroendocrine tumor. So this is another uh, image from a biopsy uh, of a breast mass, which shows this really small cells. Um, really, you can't even, it's hard to see if there are any cytoplasm. They're really packed into nests. Uh, another picture where there you have the surrounded nests of um, the tumor cells, small blue cells, and they are positive for synapto and chroma. So this is an example of your typical neuroendocrine tumor as compared to the previous uh, invasive lobular carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation. Uh, Dr. Kamali, oh, yeah, sorry. Yes. Uh, if I may interpret, do you think that this uh, neuroendocrine marker positivity or differentiation, has it any connotation on the prognosis of a, otherwise a lobular neoplasm? Well, I'm and, uh, not Do you like to grade it? The neuroendocrine, would you like to grade it on the basis of the differentiation like a neuroendocrine tumor? Mm, I, you know, I, it's difficult to answer that question because really there's no literature, especially on the lobular type of neuroendocrine differentiation. Most of the literature that we have right now is, I think, at least I cannot find out, most of it is on the ductal tumors. And so, and even if you look in the ductal world, I mean, there are, there is, there have been, there are publications which consider neuroendocrine differentiation as aggressive, but I think we don't, I, I don't know enough uh, evidence or any lit enough literature where this will have any prognostic impact. And just a quick follow-up on that question. Uh, would you really recommend doing neuroendocrine markers? Because it may often happen that you will suspect a neuroendocrine differentiation in this kind of, especially if there is a little bit of hyperchromasia. So what prompted you in this case particularly to do a to do neuroendocrine so, markers? So it this was an outside case, and it was a little complicated. She had an excision biopsy, which had this just solid sheets of tumor cells. And the person who looked at outside called it ductal with neuroendocrine differentiation, which is actually, I mean, so I think the real message is that the, those ILC variants, like the solid variant and the alveolar variant, sometimes they can come in this, so such a morphology that you, they sort of bleed into this separate category, which is a neuroendocrine. And I don't think we, I am aware of any uh, literature where people have done um, uh, neuroendocrine markers on set of lobular tumors, and they have shown that, well, so many are have neuroendocrine differentiation. Yes. But uh, the, I think the message is that if you don't, if you misinterpret the ECAD staining and you don't have P120, you may go down the ductal pathway with neuroendocrine differentiation with some of these solid alveolar variants. Absolutely. So that's, um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's do, oh, I have another case. Uh, this is also an interesting case. Uh, this patient, she's uh, postmenopausal. She, I think was 60 and uh, she had a large tumor, um, uh, T2, more than five centimeter. And this is a mastectomy and one of the sections from the mastectomy, which is right at the interface of the muscle. So these pale areas, they're not projecting very well, but that's the skeletal muscle. And you have this infiltrative lesion that largely composed of pools of mucin with uh, cells floating in it. And at this power, you really can't tell, say about the cells, but they do look forming clusters and some of them are single. And then there is this mucin uh, depleted area where you have just this similar epithelial cells proliferating the muscle. Uh, medium magnification, you can see better. You can see the cells better. There is intracytoplasmic mucin as well. Some of them are signaturing. And then there are pools of mucin. And in the areas where you can see the cells without mucin, you can see the morphology better. They are, they're not making distinct ductal structures and they are not high grade. They're sort of grade two uh, cells. All right, so ECAD was done. 
and E cat is negative, which um, after you have proven that these are epithelial cells, this in a breast uh, tumor, that means it's a lobular histology or lobular phenotype. So P120, it's a cytoplasmic staining, which goes along with E cat, but it's unusual because uh, the, the mucinous tumors that we know of, or you know, traditionally we think they are ductal. So this one is, has a ECAD negative P120, which is phenotype, which supports the lobular phenotype. So another example of similar tumor where you may think it's just a regular mucinous carcinoma, which is, just this is a core biopsy. And the first time you look at it, you will say, well, it's a mucinous carcinoma. And, but the, the important thing to note is that the cells, they look very monomorphic. They're not forming, forming any ducts. And um, so that's an important observation. And that should start the process that maybe it's lobular. And the, the mucin is highlighted by the mucic harmon. So th there is this category, sort of new category, invasive lobular carcinoma with extracellular mucin. And we, we had four cases that we shared um, as a pitfall in pathology. So these are the details of those cases. The top one is our four cases. And all the, our cases, they were older, they were postmenopausal, they were big masses. There was one case which was small, it was grade one, uh, and they were all ER positive. Uh, one of them had mucinous LCIS. Uh, the other cases that are reported, the largest series is from Boston. This, this was an ASCAP abstract. And uh, thing, and this is the European series, they had eight cases. Uh, the thing to important thing to mention is these tumors they can be um, triple positive, HER2 positive, or um, just HER2 positive, and that's a little unusual for lobulars. But you can see them in these special variants uh, of the lobular carcinoma. So we concluded that this ILC with extracellular mucin it often presents at higher stage in postmenopausal women, and they frequently show non-classical lobular histological features, signet ring cells, and they can be heard to positive. And that's one of the important thing uh, you should keep in mind when we're looking at these unusual histologies in lobular, that they, although most lobulars are ER positive, they can be PR negative and HER2 negative, but these special uh, subtypes like histiocytoid, uh, the pleomorphic, um, the carcinoma with signet ring cells, they can be uh, triple negative or HER2 positive. Um, rarely, the, there have been reports of grade one ILC classic morphology that are HER2 positive, but that's very rare. So let's go to the IHC. Um, so we, uh, we're done with the ILC variants. The e cadrin was first described in breast literature in 1993. So this is the first paper. It was a rapid communication um, in 1991. Uh, where they looked at breast cancers, they called all of them IDC, and they reported that three of them were negative. And normal breast expresses ECAD. So, well, that didn't really, uh, you know, correlate with the lobular phenotypes. So there was another paper in 1993. This was from Roland Mole from Germany. And they, they picked the real signal that when you do ECAD, in a frozen section or on a paraffin section, the invasive lobular carcinomas were ECAD negative. And this, I think this number is very impressive. No matter what study you look at on ECAD, 85, 86% is the magic number. There will be 15% lobular cancers that will show some sort of persistent ECAD stain. And other important message is that the ductal tumors were ECAD positive. And then the most important actually message here is which gets important when we are actually practicing is that the ECAD expression uh, is, uh, it, it decreases as you go from grade one to grade three ductal carcinoma. So that's very important to keep in mind that the ECAD also decreases in ductal tumors. So here's the cartoon showing you where the ECAD exists. This is the intercellular membrane, uh, intercellular space where you have this ECAD, they're interacting. And the other important part to note is this is the membrane, and then you have this bunch of catenins, the P120, the beta catenin, alpha catenin, that uh, form part of this complex, and they interact with actin. So um, I have shown you the IHC on ECAD, on P120, but there, there's IHC available for beta catenin, and there has there is a literature on those um, immunomarkers too, but I don't think it's routinely used. So that's the... The, the point here is whenever there's a dysfunction in ECAD, the P120 loses its attachment from the membrane and sort of dissolves into the cytoplasm. So that's why the 
when you're looking at P120, if it's membranous, it's a normal expression. If it's cytoplasmic, it's abnormal. So sometimes that makes it a little difficult to read, but it works in those 15% lobular tumors which show uh, uh, intact or uh, some sort of persistent uh, ECAD staining. So the P120 uh, paper, it was in 2004. So it was almost like 10 years when we were playing with ECAD and then P120 comes into picture and they showed that um, uh, the staining in the lobular tumors is cytoplasmic. In the ductal tumors, there may be reduction in P120, but it's never cytoplasmic. So that's something to keep in mind, that reduction in P120 is not, doesn't indicate cyto, uh, lobular phenotype. So here's the uh, summary on the ECAD and the lobular phenotype, and we will use this uh, when I'm showing you the examples of the ECAD and uh, P120 immunistic chemistry. Uh, so typically when we are looking at a lobular tumor, we want our stains like this, that you suspect lobular and you do ECAD, it's negative. Wonderful, immunosive lobular carcinoma. But uh, presence of ECAD expression does not preclude lobular phenotype. So I'm gonna show you a few examples on that. And, and because of the use of ECAD and when it never doesn't work in all the cases, we have all these different terminologies. And I'm showing you the terminologies from the CAP worksheets. So this is the one in 2017, or maybe in 16, where he had everything as invasive memory carcinoma. So somebody really loved memory carcinoma. And then in 2018, it changed a little bit. We had uh, invasive carcinoma with lobular features, which is when you think it's lobular, but your ECAD and P120 stain comes back as ductal and you call it invasive carcinoma with lobular features. But it, so it's actually a ductal phenotype, ductal tumor, but it's showing a lot of lobular features. So currently right now in this, uh, we have very, very, it has been really simplified and I think it's aligned with the new WHO. So you have invasive carcinoma of no special type, which means it's a ductal tumor. ECAD is positive, P120 is membranous. This is invasive carcinoma with ductal and lobular feature, which means, uh, this is a little confusing. Um, I think the way I interpret it is that the tumor has both ductal and lobular component, it means it has this intact ECAD as well as dysfunctional ECAD. And then you have the histology as well. And then lobular carcinoma is um, self-explaining. So I have a few examples on this ECAD immunist chemistry. So, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have h &E on this, but I, if you, I think you can reconstruct uh, 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 the h &E image. So here are the tumor cells. You can see why would anybody, anybody do an ECAD immunostain on it? It has this single filing, uh, some sort of decision, and this is the ECAD. And um, I wanna know how you guys, how the audience will interpret it. There is some staining, but there's a lot of loss. And in these uh, cases, especially these, some people may call it, I mean, it's okay to interpret these as invasive memory carcinoma, but um, if you do P120, there's a cytoplasmic stain. It's the same case. So this just supports the abnormal ECAD, and this will be an invasive lobular carcinoma. Uh, Kamaljit, can I interpret you, uh, interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, there was a question related to this from Ayushi from Tata Memorial. She was asking, some authors mentioned that E. cadherin should be considered positive if even more than 1% of the cells show membrane is positive. So what do you think about that, considering the previous picture which you showed? Yeah, I think that one, that is very tricky because if you start doing percentage-wise, that just beats the biology or the what, what is reported in literature. I'll be curious to read the evidence, right, from where that 1% number is coming from. Uh, because I never thought that it works as a percentage. Uh, I mean, so it may, it's possible that you can come to that conclusion, but I'll be curious to see the like the evidence. Uh, because in 85%, you will see that negative ECAD. 15%, there will be some staining. And if you go back to those guidelines or standards, the WHO says don't do ECAD. You can just call something lobular. You can it's pick good. it on morphology. So I think in this ambiguous P cadherin situation, P120 120 can really help, isn't it? It so can help, yeah. So I, I think, yeah, I, I mean, it can certainly help. I mean, and th there are situations which I was gonna say later that it will help in many of those 15% situations, but still there are some 
um, lesions which you cannot pin down. And you and there's this, uh, you know, entity in the corner, which we call carcinoma inside of it, ductal and lobular features, because you look at the ECAD and P120, you just cannot pin. And some people have gone further, they have done beta catenin and still they are left with some cases where you just can't tell it's ductal or lobular. Okay. Um, Carry on. Okay. So this is another situation. Uh, it's, it's not, we're not dealing with invasive process. So, so this was done for, this was an MRI guided biopsy for non-mass like enhancement. And we see that uh, many times in, when we're dealing with lobular neoplasia. So here you have this expanded uh, duct profile. The first thing is a solid. You don't see any duct formation and you think hmm, this could be lobular. Um, and then there is a, like a hint of dyshesion and they look very monomorphic. That's something very peculiar uh, about the lobular lesions. So you do ECAD um, and it was a little surprising and this was a difficult case. So most of the cells at the periphery are intact. This is pretty strong ECAD and positivity. And when I see this strong, I'm like, I'm done. Maybe I don't need P120, this is uh, ductal. But then in the center, there are these dishesive cells that are showing this strong uh, cytoplasmic staining. So this was really difficult. Even the invasive carcinoma had this ambiguous invasive carcinoma, which has both ductal and lobular features. So, uh, I call this mixed ductal and lobular carcinoma inside because I interpreted the ECAD staining as abnormal cytoplasmic. It's so another case. This one is interesting. So this is a biopsy uh, for a mass, a breast mass, and it shows uh, a wort uh, infiltrated process. The cells, uh, you have this, some benign uh, breast tissue. And just from the look, it looks like lobular uh, because the cells are not making any ductular structures. Their cytology, they have this round pale chromatin. There's eosinophilic cytoplasm. Some of them have vacuoles and they're diseased. So they're making linear files. How, and there's um, ALH in another section. There's some in situ process with um, uh, solid sheets, some vacuoles. So you're thinking maybe LCIS, invasive lobular, but you end up doing ECAD and you have some staining. Um, there's, but if you look carefully, this is not membranous, it's all cytoplasmic staining. And uh, I interpret that as abnormal. Um, this is your normal membranous staining. This is abnormal cytoplasmic staining. So just an example of abnormal ECAT staining. And the inside of proliferation shares the similar um, abnormal um, cytoplasmic staining. More pictures from the uh, invasive and the inside. Of. So this was ILC and LCIS with the uh, apparent uh, cytoplasmic staining. So this is just all together, the cases. This is your typical invasive lobular carcinoma with negative ECAD. This is uh, lobular with some persistent membrane staining. This was the ILC with neuroendocrine differentiation with some um, um, dot-like uh, membranous um, uh, cytoplasmic perinuclear staining. And this is the diffuse uh, cytoplasmic staining in a lobular. So, and this is one of the paper that I picked. Uh, this is actually a little older from 2008, um, Dr. Lakhani is there. Um, and they showed that uh, the, the ELCs that are ECAD positive, uh, they, 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 they said that probably the ECAD protein was dysfunctional and uh, it may be related to the molecular mechanisms of the ECAD inactivation. So that's how they um, explain this um, abnormal uh, persistent ECAD staining. And there are recent uh, publications as well that describe these abnormal ECAD immunostaining um, patterns in the tumors in invasive lobular carcinomas with known uh, uh, ECAD mutations. So this is an example of a little interesting uh, scenario. So this is a coronal biopsy of a breast mass. Um, and from the low power, you can see it's, it's positive. It's uh, positive for malignancy. There are sheets of tumor cells or sheets of cells. And, and uh, especially on the right side, the morphology is a little different from low power. The cells are a little bit more spaced. There's some, I don't know, tissue is ripped off. Um, and this part is more cellular. Um, this is the, the junction of, at the junction of those two different uh, appearing areas. Here are the tumor cells. They are not forming any distinct tubular structures, ductular structures. So you start to think about lobular. 
uh, the chromatin, the nuclear appearance will go with lobular. There's some decision, the cells, they're making these, you know, stretched, um, 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 you know, filament things. And you can, you, you I, I often see that in lobular. So, but on this side, it's more decisive and it almost looks like the cells are dying or it's like necrotic or infarcted area. Same thing at the inter interface, the less cellular area, maybe some inflammation. Um, well, this is the more cellular area of the tumor. So this was, uh, ECAD was done, and this is strong, staining, diffuse. This part has, uh, the one with was loosely cellular, was little decreased staining, high magnification. The ECAD is not staining all the tumor cells. There's some that are strong. The ER also showed this uh, heterogeneity. There is um, decreased staining in the loosely cellular areas. PR had the similar st uh, different staining pattern. Um, so this ECAD was really strong and P120 was membranous. This was, the whole question was whether it's like a mixed ductal and lobular, but uh, the point here is that the part of the tumor was necrotic and this loss of ECAD and variable ERPR staining was uh, like, was in the ischemic foci. So this was IDC necrosis with some unusual um, or loss of uh, staining for the markers. All right, I have another one. This is the last one for the staining. So this is an excision. This is a photomicrograph taken from the breast tumor um, in an excision specimen. And um, you look at this, this is infiltrative. Um, they're making vague single files but they're not terribly adhesive. They have a lot of apocrine change, which can happen in lobular. There's some mitosis. So you may think of lobular, uh, but um, um, I'm not 100% sure. So you do ECAD and this is your normal control where there's strong membranous staining. The ECAD is decreased. So you may start to wonder whether it's lobular, but you do P120, P120 is also decreased, but it's membranous. So this goes along with sort of little higher grade ductal tumor. Um, so this is IDC and you can grade two. And I think the decrease is because of the higher grade of the tumor. So next few slides. Um, so we, 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 we go beyond ECAD and then what happens is um, uh, work the, people start to prove that actually it's a clonal. So we get some uh, literature where um, the LCIS uh, is proved as clonal. It's a neoplastic proliferation. And in 1995, this group demonstrates it by loss of heterozygosity at multiple loci. So clonal means it's neoplastic. Um, then um, in 2004, um, there's another paper where they compare the molecular changes in the uh, closely opposed LCIS and ILC, and they show that the changes were similar. So suggesting that they are, they are clonal, they're related to each other. So basically the point I'm trying to make is we started as precursor, we, we changed to risk factor, and then we are again thinking that actually it's a precursor. So inside you and invasive tumors are related. Now, further slides, I, I'm going to talk about the, these uh, morphological variants the florid LCIS, pleomorphic LCIS, and they come into picture once we have the ECAD and P120. And we start to use it on these solid um, um, inside of carcinomas, and we pick these uh, uh, morphological variants the, of the lobular carcinoma inside of that can totally mimic DCIS. Um, so next slide, uh, I'm going to talk about those variants. So let's start with a case. So this is a conidal biopsy done for a calcification. And you can see why this lady would have calcification. You have this intraductal proliferation, which looks very solid. And you'll note that always there's no duct formation. That's how you, there's no cribriform. There's no uh, polarization of the cells. That's how you start to think about lobular lesions. And at the top, other finding, important finding, why I put this case is there is this uh, vacillation and you may start to think well, whether well, it's signet ring cell chain, there's intracytoplasmic mucin and high magnification. And it indeed does look like intracytoplasmic mucin, which you think about, oh, maybe it's lobular, but there's no dishesion. Um, and uh, they don't look, uh, they look pretty tightly opposed to each other. More uh, signet ring cell change. And actually there's a focus of invasion right here. So I did ECAD on this case and the ECAD was strong membranous positivity. 
And uh, this was a ductal carcinoma cytoid with focal signet ring cell change. This was not uh, LCIS. So the point here is you can see signet ring cell change in ductal as well as lobular. And uh, it's, you can see it in ductal, especially when you have this apocrine uh, morphology in the cells. Uh, just another revisit to the etching that this is the ductal process. Now this is the next case. Uh, and I think this probably is one of the important image if you can carry this uh, with you and uh, next time you see something like this, uh, uh, you start a workup. So this was done for calcification. Uh, it's a coronal biopsy and uh, from low power, you can see this expanded profiles and they are solid. And there is this called calcification associated with comedonecrosis and they almost look back to back and you may think, well, could it be solid papillary? I mean, that's a good possibility. Also note that there are some lymphoid aggregates which are described with the uh, lobular uh, lesions. Higher magnification, uh, indeed it's a high nuclear grade proliferation. I don't see any duct formation. Um, there is a description of uh, noticing the polarization of the cells at the periphery. So in ductal, the cells will be polarized. They still have know where their basement membrane or the outside of the cells is. I mean, sometimes it helps, but Indeed, I mean, the cells here, they look dishasy. There's this clear space around the cells. Um, so the question is ductal versus lobular and uh, P120 is cytoplasmic in this proliferation. As a control, there is membrane staining in the adjacent benign duct. So this was pleomorphic LCIS with communal necrosis and acid calcifications. So um, I'm gonna spend some time on this. And I think this is the last part of the talk so this, these definitions are taken from the new WHO, the 2019. And bottom line with pleomorphic LCIS is if you're thinking, looking at something and you're thinking it's high-grade DCIS, but it's actually LCIS, it's a pleomorphic lobular carcinoma cytoid. If you're going to call it intermediate-grade DCIS, then it's not pleomorphic LCIS. So uh, that's a very simple way of uh, looking at it, but then there are further criteria which you can apply. And I'm going to talk about them uh, in the later uh, slides. So they, it can have apocrine features. Uh, you can, or you may or may not see comedonecrosis. Uh, it's not a mandatory criteria to call something pleomorphic LCIS. Florida LCIS, uh, that's one thing that uh, WHO has done is they, they put, the, put it as a classical LCIS. So you're not thinking about high-grade DCIS by cytology or the nuclear atypia. However, the architecture is of DCIS and the cells have low to intermediate grade nuclei, and they look like classic LCIS. Uh, and they form a confluent mass-like architecture. They distend the ducts, and they are, which are almost back to back. So the case that we just saw, that can be called fluid LCIS. However, the nuclear atypia is like hybrid DCIS. And that's something that is confusing that, should I call it pleomorphic LCIS or fluid LCIS? Sometimes the, um, the overall features overlap because fluid LCIS is largely an architecture-based uh, uh, entity. Pleomorphic LCIS is largely a nuclear atypia-based uh, entity, and then they can coexist. Uh, then uh, these are the more details of the histological features of pleomorphic LCIS. Uh, this criteria was used since 2002. This was proposed by Dr. Middleton from Anderson, and the, they have, the nuclear size is four times the size of lymphocyte. And this is the criteria for the hybrid DCIS. So if you have any of those two uh, criteria, the proliferation if qualifies any of those two, you can call it pleomorphic LCIS. Uh, however, the way I think about it is every time I look at something that looks like uh, hybrid LCIS, that will I call it hybrid DCIS? So who saw pleomorphic LCIS first? It was uh, this publication, 1996. That's the first time the pleomorphic LCIS was used. It was a paper with Dr. Silverberg. Um, the, all, actually the case had in situ as well as uh, in, invasive uh, pleomorphic lobular carcinoma. An interesting thing is uh, it had, it was a HER2 positive lobular, which is, uh, which you can see with these uh, pleomorphic and florid um, uh, LCIS or the tumors associated with pleomorphic and florid LCIS. So going to the florid LCIS, as I already said, it's an architecture-based LCIS subtype. And here's a picture where this, uh, it's a type A or type B cells with a lot of epoprint change that are distending the ducts. So that would make it florid LCIS. Now who described it first? 
um, it was there was a publication by Jacobs, uh, Timothy Jacobs, in 2001. And they, if you look at their paper, their group one looks like Florida LCIS. They had three groups, and they it, they call it LCIS with necrosis. So this is terminology that was in use in 2000 to 2010. And there's the publication of Fadari et al. He also used the same Lynn with committed necrosis and called it Florida LCIS. Dr. Shin, she had an uh, abstract at ASCAP where she used the Florida LCIS first time. Uh, and she used, uh, she called it Florida LCIS with necrosis and calcification. So what's so peculiar about Florida LCIS? Well, in addition to that, we can confuse it with DCIS, frequently you see invasion uh, in the, and it becomes important in coronal biopsy because then the management changes if you have an invasion. And other important thing to notice, the invasive component is almost always lobular phenotype, which is, sort of in comparison to classical LCIS uh, that we have been hearing since 1941 that the tumors associated with lobular neoplasia can be of different types, but with fluid and pleomorphic LCIS, the invasive component is almost always lobular. So just one slide on the LIN scheme. It's not very commonly used. I like it because it, it sort of is very, it correlates well with uh, all the categories. So if you, I'm not gonna read the details. So there are three grades, LIN1, LIN2, LIN3. And what they really uh, overlap with is ALH, LIN1 is same as ALH, LIN2 is same as LCIS, classic LCIS. LIN3 is all the other uh, uh, types of LCIS, including fluorid, pleomorphic, and LCIS with signet ring cells. How are the pleomorphic LCIS and fluorid LCIS related? Um, they, can clinically mimic DCIS because both of them can have comedonecrosis and calcifications. Uh, how about the genomics? Uh, they have similar alterations. There have been few studies and they have shown that both of them, they are sort of advanced lesions. Uh, when you compare them with classic LCIS, they have a higher number of uh, genomic abnormalities, which are similar. They both show her to amplification, semic amplification and cyclin D1 amplifications. Here's a comparison between non-classical and classic LCIS uh, from our study on the outcomes. And things that I wanna highlight is that classic LCIS is an incidental finding. Non-classic LCIS, the pleomorphic and florid, it often presents with calcifications. And that's why it mimics DCIS. Um, uh, upgrade rate is different. 25% uh, upgrade means on um, coronal bio, if you are looking at excision, uh, after a coronal biopsy, uh, in non-classic LCIS, you will see invasion more frequent, which is higher with non-classic LCIS. Other important uh, finding is that with non-classic LCIS, you will rarely see other ductal type lesions like atypical ductal hyperplasia and flat epithelial tibia. They're more commonly seen with classic LCIS. All right, um, markers, I already mentioned it, that pleomorphic and florid LCIS can be ER negative and HER2 positive, which is unusual for classic LCIS. Here's an example. Uh, this is just one section with HER2 IHC. So the classic LCIS component was, we'll call it one plus to two plus, while the florid LCIS was um, HER2 positive, strongly three plus. Um, now, this is also important because many of these are misdiagnosed as DCIS. In our study, uh, six out of 32 cases were initially called DCIS to and treated like DCIS. Um, I already mentioned the upgrade rate. Uh, it ranges from 21 to 30% with the florid and pleomorphic LCIS. So what's, what's important, uh, this is sort of a summary, that it's important to diagnose variants are the pleomorphic and florid LCIS because it can impact the surgical and adjuvant management. Um, many surgeons, they consider re-excision if PLC, uh, pleomorphic LCIS at the margin. Radiation therapy may be considered if you call it pleomorphic type. Um, um, so it's, it's critical. So I'm gonna just go through this. So we did, the, I'm gonna share this uh, study that we did at our department and where we looked at the intra-observer variability uh, in diagnosing the pleomorphic and florid LCIS. There were six pathologists who assessed uh, the, and so in, in, in summary, the correlation was that the inter-observer um, uh, variability was high. So there were only uh, eight cases that were called pleomorphic LCIS, or actually, sorry, only three cases that were called pleomorphic LCIS by all. 
six pathologies out of 50. And there were five cases where all agreed that there was no pleomorphic LCIS. I mean, there are copper scores, they were like sort of fair to moderate. The, for fluorid LCIS, the numbers were higher because and it's self-explanatory because it's an architecture-based uh, entity. Uh, uh, for uh, all pathologists agreed that uh, fluorid LCIS was present in four cases and all agreed that it was not present in 11 cases and the COPPA values were high. So we concluded that there is a poor agreement. So um, if you have a question about um, fluorid or pleomorphic LCIS, the best thing is to show it to a fellow breast pathologist and come up with an agreement. Um, so I'm just gonna skip through these and show you some pictures from the study. So this is one of the image or a case where there was a complete agreement for pleomorphic LCIS. And this also shows you the problem. So on the left side, you got this proliferation, which is not quantitatively impressive, but the nuclear atypia is of high grade. And then at the same time, it's mixed with this sort of type B uh, LCIS cells. And, and this will lead to confusion. Should I call the whole thing pleomorphic LCIS? Or should I say it's, there's pleomorphic LCIS as well as there's classic LCIS? And often the case is it's a mixture. There's another case where there was complete agreement. And, um, and I think this it's easy to think about DCIS, uh, especially in this case, the nuclear pleomorphism is, it's high grade. However, there's no duct formation. There's some hint of mucin globules. So this was uh, another example of pleomorphic LCIS from the study. Uh, the third case, uh, pleomorphic LCIS. This one has prominent apocrine change, this dense eosinophilic cytoplasm. So this, and there's a tons of uh, dishesion. So it's difficult to miss this as DCIS. More examples where people did not agree completely. This one gets close to pleomorphic LCIS. This also has extensive distension. And one criteria that has recently come to the, in the WHO is that if you have diameter of 40 cells that spans in a profile, you can call it fluid LCIS. And it comes handy when you don't have that back-to-back -back architecture. You have just one duct the standard with LCIS, you can use that criteria. And note that there is also invasion, which you will often find in these cases. Another case where not everybody agreed that uh, it was a pleomorphic LCIS. It gets close, uh, but I think you may call it just type B cells. Another example uh, where there are three people call it pleomorphic LCIS, three did not. This had tons of signet ring cells. And in LIN scheme, this will be LIN3, but uh, the nuclear tipi, it seems like, doesn't get to uh, DCIS. So not everybody called it. This one is the most difficult because um, there is no distension. It's almost like a pagetoid involvement. Uh, and you may think of like ALH, but the nuclear tipi is high and there is intracytoplasmic mucin and signal ring cell change. So difficult, but um, this is to trigger a more search for foci of pleomorphic LCIS. An example of florid LCIS, type A to type B cells with central necrosis. It's another nice picture of um, central necrosis. Nuclei, they don't look like high-grade DCIS. They are just type B cells, florid LCIS. So here's this sort of summary slide where um, uh, the problems, so it can mimic DCIS, heterogeneity, which I already showed you a picture, how, why is it difficult to diagnose them? Um, there is al al always a mixture of population of classic and LCIS, and there's no marker. I mean, you can use, it's not recommended, but you can use ER and HER2. HER2, if it's positive, likely you're looking at a pleomorphic or florid. If it's ER negative, you're likely looking at a pleomorphic or florid LCIS. There is some literature on KI, but it's not frequently used. So what do you do if you have a diagnosis of pleomorphic and fluid LCIS in excisions? You measure the span, just like you do for DCIS. You provide the pro proximity to the margins because if it's close, it may trigger a re-excision. And um, you may use ER in problematic cases because ER negativity would favor uh, um, non-classic LCIS. So this is sort of the summary uh, of the events that we talked about. Uh, right now we have the WHO, which lists all these variants, uh, the pleomorphic and fluid LCIS. Actually, it uh, discourages using uh, variant LCIS, so don't use that. Use pleomorphic and fluid LCIS. Uh, we have talked about the risk factor, precursors, how it mimics DCIS, 
uh, and uh, two morphological variants. So this is another way of looking at it. And I like this table a little bit better. So it started as LCIS, Hagenson divided them into type A, type B, 1972. Uh, he called it lobular neoplasia as well at the same time. ALH came into picture in 1978. Uh, then we had pleomorphic LCIS, 1996. Lin2, Lin1, Lin2, Lin3, which sort of overlaps with these three entities. And then you have florid LCIS and pleomorphic LCIS. Pay attention that florid LCIS does not have the grade three nuclei. It falls, it sticks with classic LCIS. It's just the architecture. And then here you have the nuclear grades. And the, what makes it complicated, and I haven't talked about it, is the apocrine change. You can see the apocrine change in any of these. They don't really make it uh, any of those diagnoses necessarily. So last thing um, I just wanted to briefly mention because it had, uh, I had thought about this uh, briefly while I was working on lobular neoplasia that, uh, and uh, Foot and Stewart mentioned it, that it rarely involves the nipple. However, we have this publication, uh, lone publication where there was a bilateral paget disease of nipple with associated LCIS. So uh, yeah. And this is an example. So I looked at all the mastectomies here uh, at my institution. I couldn't find any Paget disease associated with LCIS or ILC. I gave up. So this is just an example of a section from a nipple, which has this large duct at the base. And this one is a little solid. And so you can also see some clearing at this magnification. So this is the LCIS, Pagetide involvement of the large duct. However, there was no uh, Paget disease. So that was the last slide. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, we can take questions if there are any. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kamalji. And uh, Ruchi, you would like to take up some questions in the chat box? Yeah. Thank you, sir, for such a nice talk. Uh, sir, Ayushi is, uh, wants to ask, only large, uh, four, uh, large nuclear size, which are more than four times, uh, in cases of pleomorphic uh, LCIS without nuclear pleomorphism, what is your experience regarding that? Would you still call it pleomorphic? Okay, let me see if I heard the question right. So uh, the question goes like this: that if there is no pleomorphism but just nucleomegaly around four times, yeah. Uh -huh. So without pleomorphism, would you still consider? That's what is her query is because she says she frequently sees large nuclei uh -huh. but lacking uh -huh. the pleomorphism. Yeah, I, I think I would just, and it's not just Ayushi. Every, I think everybody goes through these feelings. Should I call it pleomorphic LCIS? Because the way our, I think, breast teams are trained, the moment, or the radiation oncologists are trained, the moment they say pleomorphic, you know, with LCIS or ILC, they know that it's bad. So what I do is I go through the same feelings. So I just say, oh, would I call it high grade DCIS? And sometimes the extent also helps, you know, uh, and there's some literature on that too. Like what matters is how much LCIS do you have? If you have just one focus of LCIS, even if it's pleomorphic, I don't know what the significance of that is, but that matters if it's just, it's in one slide. If you have 10 slides and you're thinking of pleomorphic LCIS in six slides out of that, and it's near the margin, I think that's something where I will think really critically and say, well, okay, do I need to make it uh, so, but if you were saying that if the nucleomegaly is four times, so I'm thinking you're looking at apocrine change. Like there's the cells are really apocrine and probably they have a lot of cytoplasm also because the grading of apocrine lesion is difficult. Even, in, even if it's ductal, it's hard to call them like, usually they're like intermediate to high grade. So I, I think I see you probably are dealing with the same situation, but um, I would use the other context, right? And if you are unsure, just do the ER. I use it. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a standard, but if it's ER negative, I think you're maybe better just calling it, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, pleomorphic or florid. Yeah, I think that should answer Ayushi's question, although it's a tough call sometimes. And uh, Kamaljeet, I had some very basic as well as some wanted to look at share experience with you, what you feel about some of the things that pertaining to lobular neoplasms. So tell me, Kamaljeet, that how often do your, uh, in your RAD path conferences or the MDTs, 
do your radiologists pick up these lobular or rather i would say miss the uh, uh, lobular neoplasms and what modality do your uh, although it's unrelated to pathology a bit but i think it's important and what modality do they prefer do they go by mammograms ultrasounds or nowadays they are talking a lot about mris which are supposed to be more useful so okay yeah i guess so i will split that question into two parts the way i think about it um and lobular lesions picking lobular lesions on a uh, screening mammogram it's that's unusual because i think and i mentioned it i didn't cover it completely because there's this whole literature on how to manage lobular neoplasias on coronal biopsy because most of them you can just split them into classic lcis and pleomorphic florid so if it's classic most of the times it's an incidental finding so in that red path correlation becomes really important and it may be a little controversial but i would say that they don't really calcify classic lcis they don't present as calcification so if the biopsy is done for calcification or you're seeing uh, lcis classic lcis likely it's not a target lesion so i mean the literature recommends to a red path correlation if the diagnosis is only classic lcis on a coronal biopsy by that i mean like if the target lesion is architectural asymmetry like the first one of the cases the architectural symmetry is because of radial scar and the alh or lcis is just secondarily involving or arising in that so or if there is a mass lesion like classic lcis doesn't present with mass and you get a fibroid noma with an involved by lcis the lesion is actually fibroid noma it's just lcis is incidental so i mean that's the literature and that's the uh, that's how i approach the presence of classic lcis in a coronal biopsy now i think the other question was um, if it's a florid and lob uh, uh, the pleomorphic lcis i think they present just like dcis and that's why sometimes they are misdiagnosed as dcis because you're you know that but when you're looking at a slide it's for calcifications and you see comedian necrosis calcification solid proliferation and sometimes they can be really pleomorphic and you think it's dcis and they'd go really down the line of dcis so i think that's how i'll yeah. answer that question and could you, could you recall anything about mri being used in your institute oh so yeah so okay yeah so that's the second part of the question like how mri and i mean mri so whenever we diagnose something lobular there's a high chance especially the invasive lobular carcinoma is in, depending on the other factors like if the person has a dense breast and if this was a surprising finding they can't see it or they can't feel it it would trigger an mri so and often we will see those mr and there will be some mri enhancement mass like non mass like and we will get the biopsies but i mean the accuracy of these biopsies or correlation like are these really abnormal lesions i don't think there is i don't know of the literature and i don't think there is of these mri biopsies that they do they really pick abnormal lesions or they can pick anything like pash or apocrinesis okay thank you and there's another very basic question i want to ask you uh, is that uh, whenever you typically get a case where you suspect a lobular neoplasm what is the initial panel of immunohistochemical markers you would put up obviously the hormone receptors or to new and uh, do you routinely use a uh, myoepithelial markers in which you obviously feel that it's an in situ lesion or an excision and of course amongst these ecdrin and p120 what is your initial panel and how do you kind of step wise approach or escalate your panel further in problematic cases so if you could just get an insight to the audience about that because i think in day to day practice that would really matter yeah i <laughs> i think it's kind of a difficult question because you know i would just tell you and i tell this to my colleagues that i when i was doing a fellowship we didn't do e cadrin on one case in my entire year <laughs> there is one way of practicing right and then we did it on one case on my last day and i'd never got to see the stain because i was out so it depends how you are brainwashed or trained so um i do it whenever and what i have done is because in my i have colleagues who do it every time there's e cad and there are some who only do ecad they haven't because p120 is a new stain and it's a little difficult to interpret you have to just distinguish is there any membrane staining or is it all cytoplasmic so 
they don't do p120 so i would say what i do is if the person never had any history of atypia any adh any fea any alh or any cancer and this is her first biopsy and i'm going to give you her uh, alh that's like something that is always contentious i would do ecad and prove it as an objective evidence so okay. that anybody else sees that biopsy, you have an ECAD negative. And I, I'll, I always do ECAD and P120. Now, if somebody already has a tipia, you know, in the past, I'm not going to change anything because she already has this elevated uh, risk because uh, we didn't talk about the relative risk because uh, what does ALH mean is you're giving the person a slightly higher risk of breast cancer in the future. It's four to five times. And... Um, and most of the times it's an incidental finding in a biopsy. So first time diagnosis, I might do ECAD P120 just to prove it. If it's very focal, one or two long do. If it's everywhere, I think if you have seen pretty few ALHs, I think you can. But in problematic cases, first time I do ECAD P120. Yes. Uh, another question I had is uh, talking about markers. Do you do, what is your experience with KI-67 and what is the cutoff which your institute uses? Like for example, the, the ductal neocarcinomas, they use most places 15% or 20%. So is there anything, uh, do you do your clinicians rely a lot on KI-67? Uh, you know, okay. Well, In neuplasms. Yeah. So we at this place, uh, Women and Infants Hospital, we don't do KI on the primary tumors, like the ductal tumors. Uh, because what our clinicians mostly do here is, and I can understand that, uh, how do you use KI in a setting where you're not doing oncotype? So yes. most of the ER positive tumors in our setting, when they get excision and they're deciding, you know, and we give them grade, I think they do it irrespective of the grade though, but they do oncotype. So they don't force us to do KI. However, the only setting where we use KI is a neoadjuvant endocrine therapy. Once the person gets neoadjuvant endocrine, uh, then the, she gets an excision, there's residual tumor, and uh, our oncologist asks us to do the PEPI score. So it's like a KI 67 uh, number is part of the PEPI score, where you do the ER and the mitosis and the KI. So that's the only setting. However, at a when I was at a different institute, they used KI frequently on all the post new adjuvant cases, not on the primary core bias. And I think that's because of the oncotype. Okay. Yeah. And uh, just quickly, if you'd like to answer regarding beta catenin as a marker, should is, is it uh, recommended in your experience to be? As in addition to the armamentarium of, in context of lobular neoplasm. I, yeah, I think there's a literature on that, but I have, I think might have used it once. So okay. my, I, so I'm sorry. I, so the, the, I think the way I think about it is if you have to go to the beta catenin, that's like the third level, you have done ECAD, you have done period 120 <laughs> and you are doing beta catenin, you are really, I, I, I'm, 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 I feel bad for you that whoever is dealing with that case, it means it's a difficult case and you're yeah. trying to pin down lobular and ductal. And, and since I think then you are probably in a category where you want to say carcinoma with ductal and lobular features, carcinoma inside of a ductal and lobular features. And yeah, so, but yeah. I think I've done it once and it didn't help. Okay. So there was one more question I think I missed from Ayushi was that uh, regarding androgen receptor positivity in ILC. Do you have any study to quote or anything done? In similar lines? You know, we, we haven't done anything on androgen receptor in ILC, but that's a very interesting question. Um, the only time we do androgen receptor is for, uh, it's requested by oncologist and it's for uh, treatment purposes on a recurrent tumor. So, no, I don't have any experience with AR on ILC. And I know this is more of a clinical question, but do your clinicians, if you have any kind of recall of that, do pick 3CA mutations because that's another mutation which is said to be fairly prevalent in lobular neoplasm and it has a targeted therapy. Yeah. Pick 3CA mutated 
like our clinicians and uh, the ductal carcinomas they are frequently asking in the er positive uh, patients so i was wondering there is uh, if you could share some thoughts on that so so far i in our yeah i know, I know there is a drug approved uh, i think I, i'm but in in my experience nobody has asked i think in in our setting usually what happens is if the person has this early metastatic carcinoma it's out of all the options they would investigate it and typically they will send out a panel and based on that but to, they don't really come to us to ask for that okay so i have very limited experience with that okay so i think uh... yeah that was a uh, kamaljit so that was an excellent talk and what i gathered from your talk regarding nuclear neoplasms was morphology is of course supreme so in the context that you put up markers and get some weird sort of ihc positivity your 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 thought should go along the lines of morphology and you know it's only very very specific situations where the ihc will override the morphology of course classical ecadren is the most important marker as you said but you really showed some nice examples where ihc can really mislead you or it may be a situation where it's very difficult to interpret and i think in day to day practice this is again going to be vary from case to case and going to be really challenging for most people even the inter observer agreements may go a little disagreeable in many situations so although it uh, does sound simple that there are these three variants classic pyomorphic and but it's in real time it's really a, can pose a lot of challenges except when you're dealing with a classical lobular so i think there are all those people who must have logged in and i'm sure later on also a lot of people are going to listen to your talk and they must have really really enjoyed because it was a very focused topic of lobular uh, neoplasms which we frequently see it's not such a rare entity and it clears a lot of uh, doubts about this and especially excellent hne images which you showed coupled with some very good ihc markers and your thoughts on them and you carried us from right from the evolution of this entity to the current update so thank you kamaljit you did a wonderful job and for those of among the audience who do not know dr kamaljit has done his fellowship under dr shuart snit who is stuart snit who you know is a kind of the one of the world famous breast pathologists and uh, i have frequently interacted with kamal ji in uh, national and international conferences when i have been to us and uh, other places so it's always a pleasure to meet him he has been our student and he has done so well for himself uh, he's a especially in breast and gynae pathology So thank you, Kamaljit, for sharing your experience in lobular neoplasms, spending time with us, and really enlightening us with some real good uh, insights into this mysterious tumor. I really see. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Over to Doctor Venkat for the concluding remarks. Thank you, uh, Kamaljit. Thank you, Doctor Sandeep. Uh, and i must say that it's always such an absolute pleasure to have our student come back and deliver a talk for us uh, i think dr amit dinda must be feeling so proud that the person who did thesis under him is now one of the leading lights of breast pathology uh, listening to your talk what i felt was that when i was a resident i must have been looking at these exact same kind of lesions on the breast and somebody told me this is what you look for so i look for those things then in between people came and said look for these things and said and we look for those things and now so many more new things have come that uh, nobody expect except a uh, specialized breast pathologist would be able to appreciate this so it's indeed very nice that dr sandeep mathur and dr ruchi rathore they are doing uh, specialized gynae and breast in our uh, department and uh, therefore uh, you know they the cases which need those specialized eyes are able to get those specialized eyes uh at the end of your talk you showed some really interesting um 
I mean, uh, photographs and uh, inter-observer variations which you observed. So the same thing was seen by six people, three felt one and three felt something else. So it's not that we have arrived at the conclusion of our morphological analysis. It's in the end, uh, those of our residents who are watching, I would like to tell you this, that morphology is observation. The interpretation comes later, but your eyes have to pick up those lesions. So uh, once again, I must say, thank you very much. It's been a great journey that uh, during this pandemic, I don't get to meet my colleagues every day or even sometimes for weeks, but I do get to meet people from across the Atlantic uh, in these kind of webinar sessions. And it brings back very wonderful memories. Uh, let me thank uh, our entire webinar team. This uh, webinar uh, uh, scheme was put together by Dr. Chitra Sarkar, whose vision this was. And uh, we had Dr. MC Sharma and Dr. Uh, Rumare to guide us as the senior people who um, made this come true. And we have a team of very young faculty members, Dr. Anchal, Dr. Ruchi, Dr. Kavneet, Dr. Aruna, and Dr. Madhu. So these five are, are uh, they're the backbone who put this webinar together and uh, allow this interaction from the other end of the world to happen. So thank you to all of you. And thanks to all the rest of the faculty in the department who have been uh, so closely involved and uh, for every other team, because uh, I think we are moving into specialized pathology. So all our specialty teams are getting really into the groove of things. So we have an exciting future ahead. Thanks once again. Good night.